that, then I'll continue where we ended last time. We, we had looked at an example of the, the stable, unstable, and center subspace. Um, I wanted to mention the situation for maps. So for maps, let me get to my pen. And I'll use this symbol, um, x goes to g of x, and we're still in Rn. If you have a fixed point of a map, a fixed point of a map would be um, just like we looked at the we started with equilibria and stable and unstable manifolds for equilibrium points of continuous dynamical systems or ODEs. We could look at the fixed point of a map. Um, this is a point such that G of X bar equals X bar. And if you have a situation like that, then if you have X bar, you would look at nearby points. And just like before, we would look at the displacement vector. And if you linearize the map near the equilibrium point or near the fixed point, fixed point, you get um, to leading order. So just like before, we could do a uh, Taylor series expansion of the map near the fixed point, but to leading order, we get a um, um, N by N matrix A. So A is a constant N by N matrix. And all the linearized dynamics near the equilibrium point are given by the linear, the, the dynamics near Y equals zero. So questions like what's the stability of the fixed point of the map X bar are given by what is the stability of the origin in, uh, of, in the Y space. Now what's different for looking at a map um, is when we when we consider the eigenvalues, it's not left half plane versus right half plane. It's something that's in the unit circle or outside of the unit circle. So um, I guess I should say, what is A? A is the Jacobian of G evaluated at the equilibrium point. Somebody needs to mute, uh, or I'll mute you. Okay, you're muted. Um, all right, so we look at the eigenvalues and the eigenvectors of A. And this will reveal these, the stable, unstable, and center subspace. But it is slightly different. So we have, we'll have, um, let me draw a sketch of the, the real and imaginary axis. We've got our unit circle. This is the unit circle. So modulus one, and we'll have eigenvalues uh, that could be outside the unit circle, inside, you could have complex conjugate pair, you could have things on the unit circle, outside the unit circle. So we group eigenvalues according to whether they're inside, outside, or on the unit circle. So lambda one through lambda s, these have their, their um, modulus is less than one. So they're inside the unit circle. And 
and then lambda s plus one to lambda s plus u. These are those eigenvalues that have their modulus outside the unit circle. And then the last grouping, these are C eigenvalues, right? N equals S plus U plus C. These have their modulus on the unit circle. And then the corresponding stable, uh, unstable, and center subspaces are as before. ES is the span of these stable eigenvalues. Uh, span of the stable eigenvectors associated to the stable eigenvalues. The unstable subspace, EU, the span of ES plus one to ES plus U. So that leaves the last one of the center subspace. ES equals span ES plus U plus one all the way to ES plus U plus C, which is the same as EN. All right, so we have a S dimensional, U dimensional, and then C dimensional. And just like before, um, there's the, Um, the primary decomposition theorem it says that uh, Rn can be written as the direct sum of these three subspaces. So any general uh, displacement vector y is going to have some portion in ES, some portion in EU, and some portion in EC, and, and that's it. Um, so that's the main difference is instead of left half plane, right half plane, and imaginary axis, now it's the unit circle, inside, outside, and so on. Um, and so some kind of interesting thing can happen. Just let me sketch, uh, if we look at near a periodic orbit of a continuous system, we can construct a Poincare map. So if we've got some periodic orbit, then we can nearby, we've got this map, usually we write that as P and it takes things that are on this uh, cross section, this Poincare surface of section, it says where they go. So we could look at how points map as they come back here. And if we have a, if we have a saddle, type uh, periodic orbit. That means we could have a situation, let me draw the unit circle. So this is the, the uh, eigenspectrum. We could have both of the eigenvalues on the real axis and negative, but one of them's inside the unit circle, one of them's outside the unit circle. So what does this what does this mean? Along those directions, um, the point will actually flip which branch of the stable and unstable subspace it's on. And I've got a, an image of that that I can hopefully share. Ooh, there's some nice images. There we go. Let me 
made it so big, but I think this gives you the idea. Oops. So this is our Poincaré section. Um, so what I'm drawing, oops, here is the same as kind of that. So we've got the, what we're showing here, this is the, things seem to be increasing. So this is the unstable subspace. And this is the stable subspace. And if you have negative eigenvalues, it means that um, things are flipping sides. So that means that this, if you were to look at the invariant uh, or look at the subspaces along the periodic orbit, there's actually a twist. So things don't just continue along the same branch, they actually keep jumping between two different branches. So that's some behavior that um, you get in maps, is this um, flipping around. So that's possible. Uh, I, actually, I haven't seen this in practice, just so you know. No, I haven't seen it in a mechanical system, but I suspect it could happen. Just haven't seen it. All right. I think I need to say something about, okay, I probably mentioned these stable, unstable, and center subspaces without saying what their significance is. So let me talk about subspaces and invariant manifolds. and their significance. And largely this holds true for both the continuous time systems and discrete time systems. So let me, maybe I'll plot it here as there's the linear and the nonlinear. We've got uh, ES is the stable subspace. And this means that um, anything starting on ES, so if we have a point X starting on ES, um, X goes to X bar exponentially as time goes to infinity. Just to make that clear, that's time. The nonlinear version, so that means in the actual full nonlinear system, we call this, the symbol is W, we would say WS, um, and sometimes we write local. Um, so let's just say the origin O is the fixed point. Maybe that'll make things easier. No, oh, let's keep it this way. This is fine. So this is, the stable subspace of the point X bar, this is the, um, the nonlinear version. So what you should think of is, okay, here's X bar, here is its, here's the stable subspace, and there is tangent to the stable subspace at that fixed point is this possibly curved thing and it is the local stable manifold of X bar. Okay, so that's what the significance is. We say it's stable because if you start on it, you are going towards the equilibrium point or the fixed point as a function of time. So if we were to draw little arrows, that's what they're doing, exponentially. And so the same, uh, roughly the same behavior is true for, like I said, continuous systems and maps. Okay, that's, uh, oh, I don't know why I zoomed in. This is EU bar. This is unstable. So for any point X that's in EU, X goes to X bar exponentially as time goes backwards. So as time goes to negative infinity. 
and the corresponding nonlinear object is w u local x bar. Um, if, if you want, this is in the chapter three of Wiggins. It's ex, uh, theorem 3.2.1, uh, Wiggins. I'll try to give more references to Wiggins so you can follow along in that book. All right. Um, so just to do another sketch, if we had a, here's EU, X bar. Let me draw X bar, there's X bar. And then um, there's a curved surface that's tangent to EU. And that is the local unstable manifold. And the behavior along both the, the linear subspace and the nonlinear manifold is the same. So you get this sort of exponential thing. So usually we think of the, we call it unstable because going forward in time, things are exponentially leaving the vicinity of the equilibrium point. All right. So what about the center manifold? Uh, I don't know historically why it's called center. Uh, but we can't say anything. We don't know. We just know it doesn't exponentially go towards the origin. I mean, so go towards the fixed point as time goes forward or backward. You have to do some other kind of analysis. And that is what uh, we will get to. So this is called the center and we just don't know. Don't know the fate of points X in that center subspace. And then here's the real kicker. The behavior of points in the center subspace might be different than the fate of points in the center manifold. So you can't determine the behavior of the nonlinear uh, system, the nonlinear center manifold from the behavior of points in the center subspace. Uh, I may as well still sketch something though. Here's the center subspace of our fixed point. There's our happy little fixed point and I won't put any arrows on it because we just don't know. You have to do additional an analysis. Additional, ana and what is that additional analysis? It's considering nonlinear terms. So suppose a system has, uh, it doesn't have any unstable manifold. Um, so you find that there's just the stable and the center. Well, you know that um, at least the stable part gives rise to stability. So you're left with, okay, everything's kind of going to the center manifold. So stability or instability will be determined by what happens along the center manifold. So that is a good, uh, I think, summary there. Professor, just say, yeah. So, um, if a, if a system doesn't actually have any non-linearity, then can it still have a center subspace? If a system doesn't have any non-linearity, yes. Like, if if you had a a linear system, a linear system can have a center subspace. Okay. And it might be that, uh, but because your system is only linear then you're able to conclude what happens um, just from that. But often right. what we're thinking of is uh, we've got a fixed point or an equilibrium point in a, a nonlinear setting. Right. right. Yeah. So you said that you can't make any judgments about what will happen to the sensor manifold based on the sensor subspace. Is that even true locally? 
Yes. Okay. And I'll give some examples later. Um, uh, okay. Maybe this is the time to talk about hyperbolic versus non hyperbolic. Okay. Because that's related to this thing about needing additional analysis. <clears throat> so, equilibrium points of uh, ODEs, and then there's something completely analogous for fixed points of maps. So hyperbolic, there's this terminology that's used uh, where equilibrium points are described as hyperbolic or non-hyperbolic. And I wish it had something to do with hyperbole, but it, uh, it largely doesn't. So what you do is you look at the eigenvalues of your linearization and uh, it's called hyperbolic if the real part does not equal zero for all your eigenvalues. So if you've got a case like, like the, every, everything's just avoiding the imaginary axis is all this means. So, okay, you've got maybe something like this. Great. That's a hyperbolic point. Uh, what does it mean? I, I won't say yet, but just to say that non-hyperbolic, all you need is at least one eigenvalue along the imaginary axis. So, we could have something similar to what we've got over here on the right hand side but as long as you have even one point on the imaginary axis which could mean like a zero in this case we we've, we've sketched something that has three points um so really this is just what's the dimension of the center manifold here, uh, the dimension of the center manifold is zero. Here, the dimension of the center manifold is three. So you could think of this as it's hyperbolic if the center manifold has zero dimension. Um, and it's non-hyperbolic if the center manifold has some dimension. So that's the terminology. And um, I'll give an example and then kind of summarize uh, what hyperbolic and non-hyperbolic imply. But basically it means if you have something that's hyperbolic, you can conclude what the, uh, what the behavior is uh, for the system just from the linearization. If it's non-hyperbolic, the linearization is not enough if you're in a non-linear setting. So there's a, let me give an example. I'm gonna give an example. Uh, these are two systems that are 2D and both have a fixed point, uh, I guess equilibrium point origin. With uh, a two dimensional center manifold. So, so what's going on? Um, so we've got a mate, the, they each have a linearization matrix A that have the eigenvalues are plus or minus I. So they're definitely on the imaginary axis. And here are the two systems. Uh, the first one is the, it's a, the, the pendulum, but written in first order form. So X dot equals Y, Y dot equals negative sine x. So this is the pendulum. And we all probably know what the phase space looks like near the origin of the pendulum. So there's our fixed point. 
and around the pendulum. Um, you have closed orbits. So that means the equilibrium point is stable because all points near it stay near it. So there's no departure away. Um, if you were to do the linearization for this, right, because uh, sine x, this would give rise to, um, according to a Taylor series approximation, negative x plus, you know, higher order things. And you would find that the eigenvalues are plus or minus i. Well, here's another system. Maybe I'll put a little partition between them. So here's x dot equals negative y, y dot equals x. And from that linear part, you would can you'd get that eigenvalues are plus or minus i. But let me keep writing. It's a nonlinear part to this. So this system, if we um, if we were to plot the phase portrait, here's our origin, and points are actually um, they're going kind of a, the opposite way. Rather, this the one on the left, the pendulum is going clockwise. Here on the right, it's going counterclockwise. But things are spiraling away from the origin. And if you were to, um, I think this was mentioned last time, could we, you know, can you write systems in terms of polar coordinates? Instead of using Cartesian, if you used polar coordinates, the usual polar coordinates, R and theta, you would see that this system can be written as R dot equals R cubed and theta dot equals one. So R dot equals R cubed, what does that mean? That means if you start with any non-zero r, it's, you're going to spiral away. But it's not obvious from the linearization. So these two have the exact same linearization, yet on the left, this pendulum, the equilibrium point is stable. Here on the right, this equilibrium point is unstable. So we, and to figure that out, we had to look at the non-linear part, right? R dot equals R cubed, that's a nonlinear term. Um, you could, even if you didn't know that this could be written in, in polar coordinates, you could analyze uh, the rest of this, the nonlinear part, and conclude that. And that's part of what center manifold theory does. So this is just an illustrative example to say um, you can't conclude stability necessarily. So these are two examples of non-hyperbolic uh, equilibrium points where you have to go to the nonlinear part to see if it's stable or unstable, okay? <clears throat> I guess we could say, you know, even though they have the exact same eigenspectrum. Okay, so I've got some diagram. I'm not sure if I, if I made it up or where I got it. It's probably just a tool that I've used to try to summarize things, uh, at least up to this point. In the, uh, you first find equilibrium points. So let's call those x bar. And then you would calculate, you calculate the eigenvalues of the matrix A, which is the Jacobian of the vector field at x bar. So that'll give you, right, some eigenvalues, lambda one through lambda n. And now it's sort of like a decision tree thing. If all the eigenvalues have their real part 
not equal to zero, then the point is called hyperbolic. X bar is hyperbolic. On the other hand, if the real part of the eigenvalue equals zero, just for some, even one, eigenvalue. Well, now we're following this other branch and X bar is non-hyperbolic. Okay, let's start with uh, you know, the hyperbolic case. Um, for this hyperbolic case, and let's say all we're trying to conclude is something stable. So if the real part of all the eigenvalues is less than zero for all i, that means all the eigenvalues are definitely in the left half plane, then we conclude that we have uh, the x bar is asymptotically stable. That means that all points that start in the neighborhood of x bar will eventually end up at x bar and exponentially fast. That, that case is called asymptotically stable. There's sort of a weaker sense of stability, which uh, we might just call stable, but uh, technically it's called Lyapunov. Lyapunov stable. And that's the case where things don't, you know, end up at the fixed point asymptotically. They just sort of hang around. They don't leave. So, for example, the pendulum, the origin of the pendulum, this is Lyapunov stable. If we added some damping to the pendulum, then everything will eventually settle down to the bottom point. So, the origin would be asymptotically stable. Um, on the other hand, if we just want to conclude that a x bar is unstable, there's another branch coming out of here from just looking at the eigenvalues, and that would be if the real part of some eigenvalue is greater than zero. You just need one. And then that ruins everything, and you're left with an unstable point. Okay, but what if we have this case where the real part, uh, we don't have that the real part is greater than zero for some, uh, but we do have that the real part equals zero, and maybe for the rest of them it's less than zero. So now we, x bar is non hyperbolic. So now you have to do an additional analysis. So this is where we, we look at the, the center directions, we'll call them. Those are the directions along the center manifold. So the center directions need a nonlinear analysis. And that is, that is called center manifold theory. So I'll just maybe put it over here. then you would bring out your center manifold theory toolkit. And from center manifold theory, um, then you could find out if the point is stable, unstable, or asymptotically stable. So you might from this conclude that the point is unstable. You might conclude that it's Lyapunov stable you might even find that it's asymptotically stable. But you have to go through that extra effort. <clears throat> what happens if you have eigenvalues that are um, where the real part and the imaginary part are both zero? Um, so all that we care about now is what the real part is. Okay. So if, if, if you had one where, at least one where the real part zero, then, then you're following this branch. 
Even though the imaginary part is also zero? Yep. Okay. So this diagram at least helps me conceptualize some things. Um, maybe it helps you, maybe it doesn't. There's some other reasons why we look at center manifold theory. And I think I'll mention that. And then we'll go into kind of finding manifolds, computing it invariant manifolds, which means computing not just the flat or straight subspace, but getting the curvature. So I mean, like maybe this doesn't convince you because all this tells you is uh, stable and unstable. You actually get more from center manifold theory. You, you get more from looking at the local phase space than just answering the question, is uh, the equilibrium point stable? But those were the initial kind of guiding questions that led to much of this um, development of this theory. But you do get much more. You get uh, the geometry of the local phase space structure. And then you can even globalize that and maybe get some picture of the global phase space structure. Why center manifold theory? Uh, well, like this diagram above shows, and maybe that the example of the pendulum versus that other system is you do, you need it to conclude stability. for non-hyperbolic points. It's also the foundation for bifurcation theory. And so what is bifurcation theory? Bifurcation theory, if I were to just write it succinctly, this is how does the phase space um, and or the equilibrium point change its qualitative character as parameters are varied. So those of you who took advanced dynamics and we talked about the, the bead and the rotating hoop as a function of the parameter that describes how quickly the hoop is rotating, you know that the bottom equilibrium point went from being stable to unstable when you reached a certain um, rotation speed. And not only that, but new equilibrium points showed up. So bifurcation theory, usually we think of it in terms of uh, a bifurcation diagram where we would show the equilibrium point locations on some axis as a function of parameters on the other axis. And maybe we have something like, uh, you know, we've got a stable point so if we were to look at, just kind of use arrows to sketch how things are going towards it. So here, this green line is a stable equilibrium point and then it bifurcates and um, you've got, this is a case of a pitchfork bifurcation. So that middle point becomes unstable and I'll color that red. So the arrows are moving away from it, but then they're still going towards these green branches. Um, so maybe it's not quite clear yet what the connection is, but if we have a, let's, here's a new, here's a, here's the origin and it's an equilibrium point. And let's say this has a, there's a stable manifold for the origin. 
And then there's a center manifold for the origin. If there are any new equilibrium points showing up in the neighborhood of the origin, they have to show up along the center manifold. So if there are new points, like let's say these, well, maybe I'll do them, maybe I'll do them in green, green. And I write new, it just means as parameters vary, if a new equilibrium point shows up, it must be in the center manifold of some previously existing equilibrium point. So uh, nearby initial conditions, let's say I start with a point here. Well, it's going to kind of quickly go along the uh, follow the um, exponentially decay along the stable directions, and then it'll kind of slowly ooze along the center directions. If I started here, slowly ooze. Start here, slowly ooze. So, um, So that's why, uh, as we as we'll discuss later, it forms the foundation for bifurcation theory because bifurcations typically we think of oh new equilibrium points show up, and um, here's a new one too. Professor, yeah, so does that mean that new equilibrium points cannot show up if this was like the intersection of a stable and an unstable manifold? If this was a stable and unstable manifold, yeah, there'd be no new equilibrium points in the neighborhood of that original equilibrium point. Okay. Yeah. Um, and I mentioned something about slowly oozing, like those blue trajectories quickly go to the center manifold and then slowly ooze. This leads to another name that center manifolds are sometimes given. And I guess this is just a, kind of an aside. Center manifolds are sometimes called slow manifolds. So if you've heard that terminology, uh, because the dynamics quickly shrinks along all stable directions to them and then slowly evolves along them. And how, why is that significant? It means that the long time dynamics are determined by the center manifold of a system. So center manifolds are sometimes um, used for doing model reduction. If you have a system and all it has is that it's got a stable and a center manifold. Well, you could basically ignore the stable directions because they will exponentially kind of go away. Think of modes of a system. The stable modes will all decay quickly and you're left with just the center modes. So center manifold theory is also used for model reduction. And that's because of this sort of slow manifold situation, uh, the long time dynamics. Are given by just the center directions. So I will speculate here that if you were to look at a fluid system described by a PDE uh, for some fluids, you may find that so a PDE is infinite dimensional, but you might find that there's some equilibrium state, maybe it's the quiescent state. If it just has stable and center directions, the stable modes will quickly go away. And then maybe you have like a, it's you know not infinite, but maybe large dimensional center manifold that determines the long time dynamics for your fluid. Uh, maybe it's 50 dimensional. I don't, I don't know. There's some people pursuing that. I don't, I don't really know much about it. A question uh, regarding the connection to bifurcation theory. Okay. So you said that uh, for new equilibrium points to show up, they kind of have to be in the center manifold of an existing equilibrium point. So when there are no existing equilibrium points and you get that kind of bifurcation where they suddenly show up, does that mean that there's already a center manifold like structure in that area? Like something. Well, so I, I may have misspoke because you could have a saddle node bifurcation where 
two equilibrium points show up out of nowhere and there doesn't have to be any other equilibrium point, I don't think. But the idea is if you, because um, the assumption of this analysis is that we're already analyzing near an equilibrium point. So if we're analyzing near an equilibrium point and some other equilibrium point shows up, then it oh, has to happen along the center manifold of this first given equilibrium point. But I, I think there are cases where a saddle node shows up out of nowhere. And um, saddle node bifurcations are robust, meaning they survive under perturbations and you, you can actually see them in natural systems and it makes them scary. <laughs> Cause, uh, there's ways to detect that the saddle node bifurcation could happen. Um, so people studying like environmental systems or even the climate worry about these things. Like, uh oh, what if we're what if a saddle node bifurcation is showing up? Because that means we'll be stuck on some stable equilibrium that maybe is undesirable, uh, or the climate will be. Okay, um, I wanted to go through a one D example where we we can analytically find uh, a manifold. So because this lays the foundation for when we do kind of do the nonlinear analysis that's required for center manifold theory, we need to do Taylor expansions of manifolds so that we get not only the linear part, but then start getting nonlinear terms in terms of like second order polynomials, third order polynomials, and so on. So let me give you a 2D example. So this is a 2D example where we can compute the invariant manifolds. So I'll write it as it's x dot and y dot. x dot equals x, y dot equals minus y plus x squared. So this would be, you know, if you think of it in terms of what I wrote as the F vector field, here's the first component of F, here's the second component of F, right? F is now a, it's got two components. Um, X is real, Y is real, and so X, Y, form this 2D K space. Well, so the, the first step would be to kind of get at what are the dynamics of this um, analytically? So what are the equilibrium points? Well, looking at the right-hand side, um, I'm thinking, okay, if X is zero and Y is zero, the right-hand side is zero. So the origin is an equilibrium point. And, and that was by design. Um, but you might say, well, then how is this general in any sense? I mean, later, if you find an equilibrium point, you could always shift, do a coordinate change. So the equilibrium point is now the new origin. And then you start this whole procedure. Okay, so already the origin is an equilibrium point for this case. So if we were to take the Jacobian of F and evaluate it at the origin, um, x, y, zero, zero, what do we get? Um, well, the Jacobian is just gonna give us one, zero, zero, minus one. So if you want the linearized dynamics, um, you either just up here, just ignore all nonlinear terms or from this matrix, you would say, okay, here is the nonlinear dynamics. I'm sorry, the linearized dynamics near the origin. Now, conveniently, this is diagonal 
we've got a diagonal matrix here, so we can just read off the equilibrium points. I mean, sorry, read off the eigenvalues uh, from the diagonal. So uh, using our convention that we write the stable one first, so lambda one is minus one, and lambda two is one. So we've got a one-dimensional stable and a one-dimensional unstable manifold. And uh, the corresponding eigenvalue, I mean eigenvector, uh, at least for negative one, that is the y-axis. All right. And for E2, it is the x-axis. So we can even sketch what the dynamics looks like near the origin. Uh, the x-axis is the unstable manifold. Sorry, unstable subspace. And the y-axis is the stable subspace. So knowing that, we could put arrows on this. OK, stable. So anything that starts along ES is going to go towards the origin. Anything starting along EU is going to leave the origin, right? Because this is span of E1. Right? This is the span of E2. Great. Um, now, in, in this problem, we can actually get, uh, we can solve for what the, uh, what orbits look like in the system. Because there, look at x dot, look at y dot. Now, if I were to write um, y dot divided by x dot, this is dy by dx. And just take y dot up here and divide it by x dot. You get negative y over x plus x. And because of this, um, in this problem, like I said, we can solve the orbits. And by orbits, I mean something like getting y as a function of x. So we don't know the time component along it. We just know what the curves of orbits are. Analytically. So it turns out you could verify this if you want. Uh, y as a function of x is x squared over 3 plus some constant of integration over x. C is a constant of integration. So now we could, you know, we could just try different values of C and plot the closed curves. Um, let me write x and why. Um, so for, for C equals zero, we'll get a uh, parabola. So here's C equals zero. We get this thing. C greater than zero uh, and less than zero, we get other closed curves. Um, as C goes to infinity, we get the, we get the uh, Y axis. So um, the property of an, a, the, the local invariant manifold is that it is tangent to the, the corresponding subspace. So this curve here, maybe I'll color it in blue. 
this hyperbola, this is the local unstable invariant manifold because it's tangent to the x-axis, which the x-axis was EU. So there it is. That's the, um, and so how did we describe this thing? This is y equals x squared over three. And the, um, the y-axis itself is still the stable direction. Maybe I'll do that in green. And all other trajectories, their arrows must kind of correspond to kind of following the closest manifold. So that's what the phase space would look like. And if you put this into your favorite phase portrait plotter, this is what you'll get. Um, so that's a case where you could solve for things analytically. Um, at least, yeah, and that's the, the full nonlinear term. What if we didn't know this? What if we, we didn't know that we could do this? Well, then we could use some other systematic approach, which is computing the invariant manifolds using Taylor series expansion. So that is the topic that I wanted to talk to, and it's, it's a big one. Um, once you get the hang of it, it's, it's fun. Uh, so we'll first compute manifolds for this case, this exact system. And then we'll go on to cases where we're we need to compute the invariant manifold, uh, the center invariant manifold using Taylor series expansion. And if you want to read more about this, so this is in section 3.5 of that uh, book by Wiggins, 2003. So we will use this, uh, the above example to illustrate this. X dot, just to repeat it, X dot equals X y dot equals negative y plus x squared. And because I'm going to refer to this ODE a lot, I'll call it equation star. And we've already done the linear analysis, let's say. Suppose we want a nonlinear approximation of the unstable manifold of the origin. Then, uh, and what does that mean? All we know so far is that we've got the x-axis is the unstable subspace and the y-axis is the stable subspace, but we'd like to know something about, and we, you know, we don't know what this looks like. We want, we want to get this local approximation of the unstable manifold. So we, Suppose that this manifold, and maybe I'll drop the local. Yeah, I'll drop the local. So suppose the unstable manifold can be represented by a curve, which is y equals h of x. Why are we writing it this way? So why is this, if you want, it's the stable coordinate and X is the unstable coordinate. 
So if we're going to get anything nonlinear locally, it's going to look like a graph, right? This is going to be a graph where y equals h of x. And that, let's locally, it could be a graph because what if this goes and does something like that? Well, then we can't write it that way. But right now, locally, it's a graph. So uh, we're going to assume that we could write uh, the unstable manifold locally that way. It's y equals h of x, where currently h is unknown. Professor, but we will solve. Yeah, go ahead. Um, why is it called use? Why do we use a w? I don't know. I think it's a historical thing, probably related to a German word. <laughs> okay. <laughs> Why is EE? -E? Uh, I guess E is, makes sense as Euclidean. I don't know. Euclidean subspace. All right. Uh, so we're going to use the property that we're, we're assuming that this is an invariant manifold. So since we're assuming that y equals h of x, that this curve is an invariant manifold. That means that it must be tangent to the vector field. So at each point, it must be tangent to the vector field. Which means that, right, there's a vector field let me just kind of plot some arrows. I don't know what it looks like. There's a vector field. And a, whatever we're plotting, at each point along here, it must be along the vector field. And I'm plotting it the way it should be if this is an unstable manifold. The arrows are going away. So we'll use that property. So if y equals h of x is tangent to the vector field, and the, the vector field is this thing up here, right? The vector field star. So what do we do? We'll just take the time derivative of both sides of h of x. Sorry, both sides of the equation y equals h of x. And then set them equal. So that would be d by dt of y equals d by dt of h of x. Um, so we get y dot equals, and now we use the chain rule, partial h, partial x, x dot. This is called the tangency condition. And I will give that another name. Uh, I'll call it pound, not hashtag, but pound. Um, what are some other things we know? Other things we know. Here's a thing we know. We know that the uh, unstable manifold must it passes through the equilibrium point? I'll just write through that way. It passes through the origin. And so, what does that mean? That means that when, uh, x equals zero, y equals zero. So, that means that h of zero is zero. Okay. We also know. That this is tangent to the unstable subspace at the equilibrium point. So what does that mean? Well, we've chosen our coordinate uh, such that 
this will mean partial a, h partial x evaluated at x equals zero equals zero. Right, we've got, here's our subspace. It's that, so here's our you know, equilibrium point. We must be tangent to that, so that means zero slope. Okay. <clears throat> so we'll, um, oops. Those kind of give us a couple of terms in our Taylor series expansion. So we're going to approximate h of x with a Taylor series expansion. And that means y equals h of x. And incorporating these two facts, one and fact two, the first term is actually the quadratic term, first non-zero term. So a x squared plus b x cubed plus c x to the fourth and so on. And maybe we would just summarize what this is as its uh, order five and higher. So we can rewrite uh, this tangency condition using this Taylor series expansion. Um, we'll write it as partial h, partial x, x dot minus y dot equals zero. So I've just rewritten it. And then we'll substitute in the vector field. Substitute, I don't know, in the vector field. which was uh, x dot equals x and y dot equals, let me go here, minus y plus x. But wherever we have y, we put in h of x. So, okay, this is partial h, partial x. And just to remind ourselves, that's a function of x. What is x dot? x dot equals just x minus and so this is minus y plus x squared, but wherever I have y, I just substituted in h of x plus x squared equals zero. So maybe I'll call this pound prime, all right? And now I'll substitute in um, the Taylor series approximation. So from the Taylor series approximation, what is partial h partial x? This is 2ax plus 3bx squared plus 4cx cubed plus, and just as a reminder, the terms, I take a derivative of a fifth order term, I get a fourth order term. So I get that. So now um, this pound prime, becomes, and I've just, I'll substitute in what I've got for h of x and now partial h of x. And it's, uh, it's big. I've got two a, I'll already multiply by the x. So this is two a x squared plus three b x cubed plus four c x to the fourth plus something of order five. Okay, that's the first part here minus, and you minus of a minus, what are we getting? We get plus uh, a x squared plus b x cubed plus c x to the fourth, um, plus terms of order five. And then let me not forget, I'll have minus x squared equals zero. Okay, maybe I'll call this equation pound prime prime. 
All right. Now, the coefficient multiplying each power of x must equal 0. So I just group powers of x. All right, so two, where are all the x squared terms? Um, maybe I'll put an x squared in front or in the back here. So this is 2a, I get from here, and then plus a, and then, oh, minus 1. And then all of the cubic terms, 3b from here, and then b. And then the fourth order terms, uh, 4c from here, and then plus c, and so on. I could, you know, this goes to whatever power I, I want. Um, since the right-hand side is 0, the left-hand side must be 0, which means that each of these coefficients is individually 0. So what does this lead to? This leads to, you work that out, a equals one third. Uh, this leads to b equals zero. This leads to c equals zero. Any higher order thing would give us uh, zero. So that means um, y equals h of x equals one third x squared which is what we knew from the earlier calculation because we were able to get it. So this is, usually it doesn't truncate like this where it's zeros for all the rest of them. Usually there's something non-zero there and it's, um, you have to truncate to some order of, a, of approximation. Here it does truncate. Um, so, We've got stable manifold of the origin. Maybe I don't want to draw that that way. I'll draw it curved. It's almost like the manifolds kind of form the curved axes that have dynamical significance. So who cares about the x-axis and the y-axis any, anymore? All you care about are manifolds. Like in this case, any trajectory, it's going to kind of go towards the unstable manifold. And then actually all the long-term dynamics, dynamics is determined by the unstable manifold. So we might be tempted to call the unstable manifold the slow manifold, although things move pretty fast and they're moving away from the origin. So that's just sort of a, a note, you know, notice. Even, despite the name unstable, all the long-term dynamics are along the unstable manifold. Y equals one third X squared. So they're under that, they're all along that parabola. Um, a final note and then we'll end and start with center manifold theory next time. But in this case, so these are some other remarks, I guess. X was already the kind of original coordinate X was already in the uh, unstable direction. If you want the unstable eigen direction. And Y was already in the stable eigendirection. If they weren't, then we would have to do a transformation um, to the eigenbasis so that uh, the new x variable is along the unstable direction and the new y variable would be along the stable direction. So if we had a case, um, and this is this is the last thing I'm going to say. Oops, I thought it was, but Apple had different plans for me. Okay, so if they weren't already nicely aligned, uh, 
we would do a transformation of coordinates to the eigenbasis. And work in the eigenbasis. So like if our x direction was along here, our original x and y was there, and the uh, unstable direction was at some angle, and the stable direction was at some other angle, we would do a transformation into that basis and work in that basis. And then we could do um, this uh, Taylor series expansion. So that's it for today. Next time we'll start center manifold theory.